Welcome to Nothing Is Real, a podcast about the Beatles. Everybody thinks they know the Beatles, but how much do we really know? My name is Jason Carty. My name is Stephen Cockcroft. And we are live on tape from Dublin and Belfast. At the end of our last episode, uh, Nothing Is Real fans, we were uh, looking from February into March 1970 when... Uh, there was a Let It Be single that was ready to come out while John was performing Instant Karma on Top of the Pops, but no Let It Be album existed as such. But under the auspices of people including Mr Paul McCartney, a certain P Spectre was flying in to the UK in order to sprinkle fairy dust upon the Get Back tapes of January 1969. That's pretty much where we're at, isn't it, Stephen? Pretty much. Phil has flown in, done the, done the Instant Karma, and then flown off again so he actually yeah. goes back to america probably just to have a lie down <laughs> on the plane on the plane but what what he actually does is he goes back to america does another remix of instant karma without john's approval or knowledge and puts that out as the uh, american single so they're actually two different mixes one of which does not have john's approval yes and is that a harbinger of things we'll, to come we'll just park that there <laughs> <laughs> There's all these kind of, um, you know, Chekhov's gun, you know, the, the notion of Chekhov's gun in drama. So you introduce a gun in the first act, it has to go off in the third act. So we, we like to drop these little Chekhov guns into episodes. So yes, he remixes a single without anybody knowing. But the single that does come out on the 6th of March, 1970, is Let It Be. It comes out on the 11th of March in the US. And if you are a Joe Punter, you might think, well, here's a brand new Beatles song from a brand new Beatles album, Ed Sullivan, on his... Ed Sullivan show introduces a clip from the movie, the, the famous clip of Paul with his lovely puppy dog eyes peering over the top of the piano. And he goes, here's a new clip from the new single from the Beatles. And so, you know, this notion of business as usual. Here's a here's a brand new single from the Beatles. And, you know, let it be. Bit of a classic. Bit of a classic. A uh, bit of a rip-off of... Uh Bridge over troubled water isn't that what people thought at the time? That, well, no. That no, we, we all know that that's just we not true. We all know that's that, not true. I know. We know that that's not true because obviously "Let It Be" has been in the ether since January 1969. But um, it does become the song that knocks "Bridge Over Troubled Waters" off the number one spot in the US. And there is something very similar about them. Obviously, they're these yeah. kind of hymnal, piano-led, you know, slightly orchestrated songs. And again. This thing we mentioned in the last episode of, you know, the 60s are over, it's the 70s. There's this kind of, I'm never sure how to pronounce the word, elegaic, elegaic. El- elegaic. <laughs> elegaic, thank you elegaic. very much. You're more more accustomed uh, to, uh, more cultured than I am. But it, it, there is that kind of feeling about those songs. They do seem to be of a type. And while Simon and Garfunkel are knocked off the number one spot, sitting at number three is Instant Karma. So, brilliant. I think that's very telling. <laughs> that, uh, you, you know, Instant Karma is right up there, top top level of the charts in America at the same time as Let It Be. And, of course, Let It Be does not get to number one in the UK. No, and this is interesting because we, we talked about something come together not getting to number one and we sort of tut-tutted by saying, well, that's because they pulled a single off an mm. album. Will they never learn? But Let It Be comes out as a pre-album single. There is no album to, uh, to, to to get Let It Be on at that point in time, and it fails to get to number one in the UK. And that is unusual. I think that is interesting. It, it, mm. it, is it the fact that the the sort of machinations of Apple and all the rest? You know, the Beatles have been in the, the newspapers possibly more because of uh, John and Yoko's activities, because of the business uh, issues around Apple. Is is there a sort of a general turning away? Is it the end of the decade, people moving on or people people turning around to look for new things? I mean, 70s rock and 70s pop, are, 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 by this stage, are two very different things. But the, there's something about Let It Be, the album, I feel in the end, that comes out as being somewhat kind of North American. I think it's the most mm. North American kind of Beatles album in a way. And Beatles singles in the UK had not been ballads. They had been... Pot boilers. They'd been yes. up tempo toe yeah. tappers. And okay, the US had had yesterday and a few others, but not in the UK. So, in terms of daytime pop radio, Let It Be might have been a bit of a more difficult sell. Yeah, that could be that 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 could be that could be right. I certainly think Let It Be the album is a much more American 
mm. uh, oriented sound. Uh, you know, Billy Preston, that kind of soulful feel that he brings to a lot of it. Plus, you know, uh, the spectra production is, yeah. is 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 an issue. Yeah, Could and be. the the the. the the other thing I would say is, you know, in the UK at that point, the, the, the outlets for pop music are very slim. There's BBC Radio 1. There is no independent local radio yet for, for pop music. So if it doesn't fit the BBC Radio 1 remit, yeah. um, you know, it, it might have been seen to be, you know, something that was a bit slow and languid. Maybe. I, Maybe. I, I don't know Maybe. where it went in the playlist. But March 1970, again, it's fun to see all these little things that become codified in 1970s Beatle lore. George and Patty moved to Friar Park. We don't really assume, we don't think of Patty when we think of Friar Park. No, no, but this is this is the day that they, they moved to Friar Park. Um, yeah. And the other thing, just to, again, because of foreshadowing, we just mentioned that the same day that Let It Be comes out, Ringo finishes the Sentimental Journey sessions. So he, he will make a promo film later in the month, but we just need to park that fact as well. But yeah, George and Patty move into Friar Park um, and... Uh, Get ready, get ready for their, you know, housewarming party. party. Well, now this is, this is the hot topic of negotiation as to whether all the Beatles are at the housewarming slash birthday party in yes. March 1970. Yes. And you think they would have, you know, Paul would have remembered that kind of thing, his mind like a steel trap? Well, we get him on the podcast and that's again, that's <laughs> added to the list of, you know, now that you're here, you know, this is the kind of question that, you know, Bob Mortimer or Idris Elba, they're not going to. They're not going <laughs> to ask him. They're not going to get there. It's so, going to be. Do you remember St Patrick's Day, uh, nineteen seventy? <laughs> were you at, were yeah. you at George's house? Uh, what makes me think is it now? What, why we're saying this? And again, I think we've touched on this before. Is this is this is Chris O'Dell who was was working for Apple and was everybody's assistant? Um, she's very entertaining, very entertaining book. But she says that all of the other Beatles were there alongside Derek Taylor. Neil Aspinall, uh, Peter Brown, Klaus Voorman, and it was a huge success. Now, I suspect Paul is not there. Uh, mm. At very least, Paul is not there because the day before, 16th of March, Ringo is at the Talk of the Town nightclub filming a promotional clip for Sentimental Journey. Now, Talk of the Town was a very kind of... Um kind of swishy nightclub I think it was in Regent Street yeah. and it was kind of unique at the time I guess it would have your Shirley Bassies and it was kind of a Vegas style have your dinner sit in watch a band That's it. and they do a big performance show so um, yeah. um, Tom I think my parents went to see Tom Jones there around this time so it was that type of place yeah a kind of Ringo in a basket kind of uh, supper, <laughs> yes. supper, supper club um, and uh, so yeah so Ringo was filming this promotional clip and George Martin is there and being Ringo being a Beatle there's an orchestra and the whole, you know, the kind of whole shebang is there and they're conducting the orchestra. And Ken Womack in his book identifies this is the day that Paul calls George Martin up and says, John's taking the tips. It's like Watergate. You know, it's... It's, it, it's like give my regards to Broad Street, Stephen. That's, it that's is, what it's that's foreshadowing. Exactly what Harry's it is. got the tapes. <laughs> That must be where he got the idea from. But he's talking about the Get Back tapes. Yes. So I, I have a question. How does Paul make that phone call? <laughs> when nobody he gets his mobile phone. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Nobody so. has a mobile. So does he Does he have to kind of get his people to ring around and, uh, you know, ring Abbey Road, ring George Martin's home? Uh, you know, George Martin's wife says, oh, he's the talk of the town. So then he rings talk of the town. But because all of that, you think that's a phone call that you make in a hurry, you kind of think, yeah. you know, oh my God, John's taking the tips. But he presumably had to go through this whole ring roll. Anyway, he reaches uh, uh, George Martin and says, John has taken the tips, the, uh, the get back tips. Why would he ring George Martin? Why would George Martin? George Martin at this point is a hired hand. And he is. so he's, he's not an employee of EMI. He doesn't really, he's kind of been in this odd backseat position for all of Get Back mm. uh, and I think has been very patient with it but he's never been in the frame for sorting out the Get Back tapes why should he give a hoot? I think it must be because he's do he has done work on Let It Be he's done he's done the single yeah you know he oversaw the orchestrations the uh, the backing vocals the overdubs on Let It Be so but for whatever reason so you think if this is true then Paul knows at this point that something is up that Spectre is in town, he's at Apple, 
Spectre's name is all over the press. He's produced Instant Karma. And uh, he, he must recall that only a few months before he had said, yeah, that's fine. Get, let's get Phil, Phil Spector in. So he must know what's happening. And if he doesn't know what's happening, and George Martin doesn't know what's happening, Ringo was standing there in his tuxedo. He could have told him. He could have told him. Yeah. So this is the point, I think, 16th of March, this is the point at which Paul <laughs> Liberty knows. Bell Day 7. <laughs> Liberty Bell Day 7. But I think, I, I don't think it's Liberty Bell Day 7, but I think it's the point at which Paul knows Phil Spector is in the room with the yeah. tapes and, and that something is happening. And if he wanted to know, Ringo is in the room when this conversation on the phone is, is taking place. It, it, it's very, very, very curious. And you wonder, you know, again, we cannot go into his state of mind or what game he was playing or whether he was going along with things, thinking things would correct themselves. Maybe he thought, well, George Martin's done the single. Why can't he pull out the, mm. the, the tapes? But, you know, the single is out at this point in March 1970. And the... the, the the, the movie is planned. Like, the movie is getting ready yep. to come out as well. And Klein's big idea is that there has to be an album when the movie comes out. So K Klein is very much thinking like a modern-day manager. There's got to be synergy, baby. There's got to be an album and a movie and the single, and the name of the single reflects the name of the album and the movie, and the single advertises the album. And it's it's actually very farsighted, clever, but it's... That's the push. That's the job. That's the push. That That is the job. That's what he was brought in to do was to manage the business and rationalize things at Apple and start making money. And he is doing that. Now, I suppose the, the question that I would pose is, if at this point, Paul on the 16th of March thinks, I don't want Phil Spector near this project. Uh, I want George Martin. He has ample opportunity at this point to intervene and say, um, no, no, I, I want George Martin or to do the whole thing or I want George Martin to do my songs or do something to intervene. But, it is, yeah. But what I was going to say is, but I think we've already got to the point where we're thinking 12th of February, uh, Instant Karma, Paul is thinking, that's it. John has left the Beatles. Yeah, I'm being left behind or things to that effect. Yeah. You know, I don't, there, there isn't really anything to fight for, possibly. Mm. The thing that always amazes me about all of this is that the Let It Be album comes out on the 8th of May, 1970. It does not exist on the 24th of March, no. 1970. So just kind of seven weeks beforehand, uh, the 24th of March is, I like to think it's kind of a type of sliding doors type day, Stephen, because this is the day that, um, McCartney is in Abbey Road and he is making master copies of the McCartney album. He's added his proper songs yep. along with his Crina Corre, you know, Arrow recording experiments. And um, Phil Spector is in a back room, room four of Abbey Road. Um, apparently Alan Klein and George Harrison are there too. And this is where Phil Spector starts work on um, Let It Be. So the 24th of March for an album that comes out on the 8th of May. Yeah. It's 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 wild. As well as that, it's like a French farce. You imagine it's kind of people <laughs> nipping in and out of rooms and going to the toilet yes. and the canteen and, oh, and uh, avoiding and, the vicar. Uh, avo <laughs> and, and no one, no one is kind of bumping into each other. You know, Paul. Does Paul know that they're there? Does 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 George and Klein and and uh, Spill Spectre know that Paul is up up the corridor? You know. Well, you'd think that you know Paul for all his subsequent protests you know at that point he could have been in the room he could have gone in shook his hand or uh, and again we don't know was he playing dumb I think he was booked in under a fake name for these mm. Abbey Road sessions so that might have passed you know, some of the people by like his name wouldn't have been on any of the studio lists for the day for that work the receptionist is going oh Billy Martin is in uh... <laughs> yeah you know Paul is dead Paul's dead replacement is back in so um, Spectre is there on the 24th of March. And I think there's sometimes this notion that, oh, good old Phil Spector, he went through all the tapes and he, he pulled out all the best sessions. And I have to assume that in the weeks between Instant Karma and the 24th of March, he's probably had a listen to some of Glyn Johns' albums, mm. you know, some of his versions. He knows what the key songs are. He's getting ideas for what he wants to, to do with them. So he's not walking in on the 24th of March He's saying, okay, give me the 60 hours of tapes or whatever it is, and I'm going to work my way through them. He's 
you know, th- you can see the lineage between what Glyn Johns is doing, you know, what's in the movie and what eventually comes out on, on Let It Be. It's obvious that, you know, well, there's the big songs, Let It Be, Long and Winding Road, there's the George songs, there's, you know. So he kind of arrives and he gets to work pretty quickly. Like, it's a very short period of time that he's putting this album together. It is. I mean, he's actually in, in the studio working on this for effectively nine days from start to finish. But I think you're yeah. right. You know, he must have done some preliminary work. But this yeah. notion that John talks about from time to time about wading through take after take after take and ours to find the best take. Well, one, we know he doesn't use the best takes because the best, yeah. <laughs> some of the best takes have subsequently um, uh, uh, emerged. And we also know where they're saying Everything was terrible. It was awful. He had to work so hard with what was there. We've seen Get Back, the movie now. We've yep. seen the Peter Jackson movie. We know how frustratingly or how tantalizingly close they were at the end of January. You know, that yes. first week in February, they could very easily have pulled together the album and the running order and the sequencing that we ultimately got and used different different takes than, than we ultimately yeah. got. You know, they were so close to having a finished album at that point. It, it, it's very strange that it just sat. It is strange. And Let It Be is a different album to get back, uh, Glenn Johns' album, and it's also not, <laughs> you know? It's also kind mm. of the same in some ways. You know, you certainly can see how you would take one and figure out a way to get to the other. So on Phil Spector's side, he definitely fulfills the remit, which is to take this stuff, remix it, sweeten it, you know, make it commercial. That's what he's there to do. And as you say, it's nine days and it's seven sessions in nine days, six mixing sessions and one recording session, which goes from the 24th of March, which is a Tuesday, to April the 2nd, which is a Thursday. So from Tuesday one week to Thursday the following week. And, you know, the people who are most involved from Apple are Klein and and, and Harrison. So at this point, Harrison is kind of getting his feel his vibe on for for working with Phil because that's going to come down the tracks. Yes, so Harrison was a big champion of of Phil Spector and we had that quote in the last episode uh, you know about how much he admired him. So Harrison is sitting with Phil while Phil is doing this. So there is a beetle in the room exercising some degree of supervision. Uh, I wouldn't say control uh, in the sense of how could you control Phil Spector, but there, there's a degree of supervision and input. And again, you mentioned in earlier episodes about Harrison learning his trade, his kind of production chops. This is all part of that, I think. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah, he, he he's he's kind of learning and he's, it's definitely, you know, between things like, and we've talked about our All Things Must Pass episodes, you know, it kind of starts with the Delaney and Bonnie experience and, you know, the Spectre experience and the Apple experience and all those things kind of lead to him starting work on his own music Um essentially in a couple of weeks' time, at the end of May uh, 1970. Mm-hmm. Um, so we can briefly kind of walk through the, the, the days that Spectre spends in the studio because it's very efficient. There's very little that doesn't actually make the cut. Uh, 24th of March, he works on um, I've Got a Feeling, doing um, stereo mixes. Um, he works on Dig a Pony and he rec- removes that kind of all I want is you refrain that's quite jarring when you see it in the movie. You're like, I don't remember that. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that comes at the start of the song. Um, he does a stereo mix of a uh, rooftop performance of one after 909 and he uh, extends I Me Mine by, you know, turning it from a one and a half minute song to a two and a half minute song. And I think that's the right move. And not- noticeably, that extension of that song remains on the Let It Be Naked uh, album. They they keep the extended version. So I think that was a, that was a right move. And then in comes Across the Universe. Now, does does across the universe warrant its place on on let it be you see i don't think it does i think it's quite jarring i i think it doesn't work on the glenn johns mix and i don't think it it really it 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 stands out and stands apart sonically and i think this this should really have been a b-side somewhere along the line you know nice to have you know my name look up the number on let it be, but this could, this could easily have been a B side, you know, and or else it could just have been let go. Uh, the fact that it's in the m- movie is simply because John is going through what he's got. Go, yeah, he he's run out of material. He doesn't have new material. Uh, the way that that uh, Paul does, the way that George is bringing in a new song every day, uh, so he has to go back to this. And he's never satisfied with it. But I I just don't think stylistically, lyrically, there's nothing about this that sits comfortably in, in the mix. So uh, if I were Phil, I would have... Um, <laughs> nixed it. I would have nixed it, yeah. 
But uh, yeah, and I, I, I know I've, I've said in the past, oh, yeah, maybe I mean mine could have been the B side to Let It Be, but that was never really going to be the, mm. the case, even though they it's recorded too good. It's the too good. It's too good. Yeah, but it would have been classic kind of give George a B side. But I mean mine is, is f- um, flagged for the album, but you know, unfortunately, uh, Don't Let Me Down kind of falls down by the wayside. But that's kind of a, a full day's work while Paul is in another corner of the room <laughs> putting together his uh, Bowl of Cherries album. Um, Phil is is working through that. The next day, he makes stereo mixes for for You Blue, uh, Teddy Boy, and two of us. Now, Teddy Boy doesn't make the cut. I wonder, uh, you know, that that kind of feeds into this narrative that you know he was kind of looking through the songs that Glyn Johns had, and he's kind of tinkering with Teddy Boy. But obviously, Teddy Boy gets ditched, and probably rightfully so. Yeah, I mean, it, the the question is, does it get ditched because Paul has a new recording? on the solo album that's coming out or more likely it seems to me that it gets stitched because it's not in the film. Yeah. Because uh, how could they have known that it wasn't, uh, it it was appearing on the McCartney album, you know, unless Paul had let that be known, but he's working in such secrecy that he's unlikely to pick up the phone and say, Oh, by the way, this secret album, (laughs) I'm I'm going to be using Teddy boy. So don't put that on the, uh, it, it's another one of those what ifs that if two albums had come out in the, you know, back to back with each other and Teddy Boy is on both of them and, you know, it manages to be the worst song on both albums. That'd yeah, be a good trick. That'd be a good trick. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Teddy Boy. Yeah. Anyway, um, 26th of March, he's working on The Long and Winding Road. So that's a stereo mix. And um, he's tinkering around with paul's kind of monologue and talking in that yes because you know we we come on and spend 30 40 minutes talking about uh the the orchestration on long and winding road but let's not forget that what (laughs) phil does do is remove paul's monologue uh so there's a little kind of spoken passage in in, yeah and and he because again one of the things that gets bandied about is uh Phil, Phil Spector erased Paul McCartney's vocals from The Long and Windy Road. He took out the monologue, the little kind yeah. of, you know, uh, like Diana Ross kind of spoken section and <laughs> yes. Ain't No Mind How You Know. Uh, that, he took that out. That's, that's what he removed. So it's not that he was kind of removing vocal. He took out the spoken thing. And interestingly, I've never heard a version uh, subsequently where Paul has decided to put that back in. That is a good point. And Phil also kind of comes back to that point later on. Um, he does a remix of Let It Be. He adds those kind of very Phil Spectre-y, um Ringo hi-hat noises. Yes, where they go, yeah. So that's how you can tell whether you're listening to a Phil Spector version of Let It Be or not. Um, five mixes of Get Back, which is not a rooftop Get Back that he works on, which is very interesting. It's from that day where yeah. Peter Jackson has said there's some recordings pre-rooftop, which are fantastic, that were left out of the movie, where they kind of run through everything. And then it'd be lovely to get those. Fortunately, all those songs are on the Let It Be box set. As, oh, they, no, uh, let uh, me check. No, 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 I don't think that's the case. Boo. And, uh, and then he mixes Maggie May. So three days in, he's kind of barreling through all these songs. Um, 27th of March, it's his fourth day. And he, he, uh, he's putting snippets of dialogue together and he's kind of working on Dig It. Not a very productive day when you're kind of trying to figure out which, which are the best 49 seconds of Dig It to use. I, 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 I think it's funny that he has sort of done, you know, three, four songs a day and then the <laughs> third day he just kind of spends all his time with these two <laughs> improvised versions and he gets it down to 49 seconds. This is the best 49 seconds. Yeah, well, maybe he did give it some proper thought. And it's also the day that Sentimental Journey comes out. And as I said in the last episode... I don't mean this to sound snide, nobody cares, but it's not a threat. It's not part of the overall arc of what is happening that Ringo is putting out, you know, a pretty solid album, a concept album. Yeah. Um, and it's a proper solo Beatles album, the first proper solo Beatles album. And it hits the top 10. It's a top yeah. 10 album in, in the UK. It gets the number 22 in the States. But uh, this is, this is uh, I, I really like this album. There are, there are one or two songs where you think his voice is just not suited to that that particular song they should they should view something different but if you think something like bye bye blackbird that's a Mm. that's perfect for him yeah and uh it it is also i I mean i may be wrong in this but i think it's the first time a rock star has done this kind of standards album whereas now everybody does that you know, yeah. everybody wants to do the Ameri- Great American Songbook or whatever it is. Uh, you know, Paul has done it. Well, Ringo got there <laughs> yes. first. 
Uh, yeah, Kisses on the Bottom is a tribute to Sentimental Journey. That's what yeah. everyone is saying. Yeah. But it, it also feeds into this notion of Apple is a business. Let's get some product out. The number one business they have is selling records and yeah. is John Paul, George and Ringo records. So let's just let's just prime the pump. And if there was better communication, that's exactly what they should have been doing because that's bringing money into Apple. You know, Sentimental Journey being a top 20 album in many countries around the world. That's the whole point of this exercise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, back to Phil Spector. He takes a few days off. He's back on the 30th of March. And again, not a very productive day. He tries to make an audio sound collage of vocal snippets from the film. This sounds like a fantastic idea. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, again, you, is this that he's he's trying to do something with the original brief? You know, this is a soundtrack. So, but again, it's an entire day. Uh, so it's a little tape loop. I've never heard this, but supposedly a 16 second tape loop using the, the instrumental break from For You Blue and then all of that, you know, vicar, vicars and people, ladies in the street. I quite like the sound of these young chaps and all the rest. There, there's a great uh, YouTube video of the, the sound reels from the Vox Pops on the Ground, which is on YouTube and you can hear the Beatles playing on the roof and you realise how loud it is. And you realise that it's absolutely them and all these kind of vox pop. That's a fantastic thing to, to dig out if you're on YouTube, folks. We've, we've put up a link to it before, but it's very, very uh, interesting. As a side point, Stephen, have you ever heard the Monkeys album Head, the soundtrack to the movie? I have indeed. I have uh, indeed. I wonder if that was supposed to be an inspiration to to the Beatles, maybe? Well, you think how many, how many soundtrack albums now do use that? They do use little clips. I'm thinking, you know, obviously you're a big fan of... Queen, Flash. Yes, Gordon's alive, all that stuff. <laughs> um, yeah, there's that kind of stuff. Well, the, the Monkey's album Head came out in 68, and there's only six songs in the movie, so they padded out the album with you know, kind of this audio concrete verite pseudo revolution yeah. nine kind of chop up of, of, of pieces of dialogue from the film and, and, and incidental music, and it works quite well. It's a top album. You would recommend. Love it. <laughs> I love it. I of course I love the monkeys um, so you know we're, we're getting to the end of March um, anything happen of note at the nope, end of March? No, nope, nothing no. Not, not, nothing at all nothing of consequence uh, um, oh sorry uh, 31st of March but I have a note here it says Liberty Bell Day 3 <laughs> 3 how many Liberty Bell Days are we at now? Um, this is the famous uh, day which has been recounted in certain biopics ever since where Ringo delivers the letter the letter yeah. And again, Ringo, man of no threat, top 20 recording artiste, uh, is sent to bring a letter to Paul, and it goes fantastically well. It goes fantastically badly, that's right. Mm. <laughs> so, so the point here is that there's suddenly a glut of product yeah. on the market. Uh, so Ringo's album has come out the day before, and uh, the Let It Be album is being prepped the movie is going to come out hey jude is still rattling around uh in 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 the charts and paul his album is coming out so they decide well look we can't stop the let it be soundtrack and film that's all gone so we 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 just need to delay paul's album for a little bit now paul is effectively beyond communication at this point um if you remember back in in liberty bell day two uh the, the, George had tried to contact Paul and yeah, realised that Paul had changed his phone number and nobody had his phone number. I don't know whether that's still the case, but whatever, <laughs> Paul is not coming into Apple. Paul is not present, so they need to communicate this. So Ringo said they were just going to send, you know, a boy round. He would have gone round there and never been seen again. Um, <laughs> And Ringo says, you know, it's Paul, I'll take this round. And it basically, the letter says, it's stupid for Apple to put out two big albums within seven days of each other. So we sent a letter to EMI telling them to hold your release date. It's nothing personal. Mm. And Paul does take it personally, to put it mildly. does take it personally, because this is his solo album. This is, at whatever point, this is that he is absolutely committed and invested in this and he just sees this as I have no control over anything I have no control over my music I have no control over whether when it goes out I have no control and there's a massive uh, rye and it almost comes to blows Paul has said you know it was near enough and he throws Ringo out of the house so this is another 
huge altercation between Paul and one of his bandmates. This has echoes of the Cher yeah. differential meeting where it's John is having to be held back from hitting Paul. Here, Paul is holding himself back. Yes. And you do, you do kind of wonder, you know, the, this is on the 31st of March, we think. On the 26th of March, Paul is kind of finishing his album. So yeah. at some point, it pops up on the radar of Apple that there is a finished album by Paul McCartney and Paul is wanting to put it out very quickly. Irrespective of the fact that John Lennon, with his Instant Karma song, I have to record it and get it out as quickly as possible. Yeah. That's totally fine. Nobody has any beef with John say John can you can it there's a Beatles single out in a month's time just you know we'll put your single out in the summer but Paul might think that there's a bit of a double standard there you know well why can't I do what I want to do I think that's right because you know we we, we mentioned let it be gets the number one in, in Sakama is at number three in 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 the chart yeah. so there was no no impact or no discernible impact on the single but yeah it's the same same thing absolutely uh, and, and it is a day that Ringo still talks about in interviews that Paul still talks about in interviews that you know Ringo you know the most difficult man to to have a row with has yeah. a row with Paul um you know Paul uh, this is apparently also around the time of the famous conversation with George where he calls George and says hey, you know, I want to get off the label and George says you'll stay on the fucking label Hare Krishna and puts the phone down there so th- <laughs> there seemed to be there seemed to be a couple of days of toing and froing after the, the bus stop with Ringo. So th- there's an alternative offer put to Paul that says, look, okay, we'll put your solo album out first, but can you just sign the management contract? Yeah. Kind of an attempt to trade this off. And, and he says, absolutely not. I'm not signing the management contract. Now, that, that seems to me to be reasonable offer. Paul's offer that prompts you'll stay on the fucking label, Harry Krishna, is he basically says, I want off the label. So this is absolutely by this stage, you know, Paul is saying, I, I want nothing to do with Apple. I want yep. I want to leave. So he's moved very quickly from the, the 11th of February uh, before Instant Karma is on top of the pops and he's not recorded his proper songs for the album to suddenly now, uh, the first couple of days of April, he's saying, that's it. I, 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 I want off so everything has escalated very, very quickly over that very short period. Yeah, and uh, what could possibly make matters worse? Checks notes. Oh, the next day Phil Spector goes in and adds an orchestra to The Long and Winding Road across the universe and I, Me, Mine. Um, the one recording day that Phil Spector has in the studio. And, you know, if Paul didn't have a reason on the 31st of March to be annoyed, he's certainly a guy who's looking for reasons to be annoyed. And the following day, these this recording session happens. Yes, I th- I think so because again, what you have to bear in mind is that he he has known uh, since that day, sixteenth of March, the Phil Spector is on board. Thirty first of March, he knows when Let It Be is coming out. He's been given a release date. They're saying we can't have your album and Let It Be coming out within a week of each other. So he knows the release date of the album. He knows that Phil Spector is working on it. He knows that he has had zero input into what has been happening over the last couple of weeks. But he's chosen to have zero input is the way I look at that. He's not, he's he's withdrawn from Apple. He's put, put the wall up. He's behind the gates at Cavendish and he's simply not engaging. And I think that's important. It's understandable. I'm not saying it's not yeah, understandable yeah. but it's it's in the context of what will follow and the narrative that we get i think it's important that he had the opportunity here for a couple of weeks to go in and, and simply say i'm not having this i don't want yep. phil specter i want george martin or to just stop the whole thing and he doesn't do that and it's a full-on recording session 18 violins four violas four cellos one harp three trumpets three trombones two guitarists and 14 singers so slightly more over the top than a uh, George Martin session, perhaps, except for A Day in the Life, and one other extra person. And one Beatle. And one Beatle, Ringo Starr, tapping away rhythm to keep everybody uh, going. And apparently it cost EMI a sum of £1,126 and five shillings, which is 19 grand today for a day's recording. But obviously worth it to get a, a more Beatles product into the into the shops. So the, there's a score, 
arranged and conducted by Richard Hewson, and that's for The Long and Winding Road. Across the Universe is done by uh, Brian Rogers, and John Barham scores the choir for The Long and Winding Road and Across the Universe. So bear in mind Richard Hewson, who will work closely with Paul yep. uh, in, in, in future, uh, so he, Paul doesn't hold that against him, and John Barham, who will work extremely closely with George um, right across the next sort of five, six years and beyond. So an awful lot of overdubbing on these three songs this day, proper, the only recording session that Spectre does for the album on April the 1st. He also sort of annoys the musicians, tries to get more out of them than than, than is necessary. And they, they, they like to work for money. These they do, musicians. they do. It's not the art, it's the money these sessions take. <laughs> so it's, it's, the first thing is uh, Brian Gibson, who's an engineer, he said, uh, you know, Phil Spectre wanted to hear in the room what this would sound, sound like. And he... he was throwing a bit of a tantrum and Gibson says, you know, Ringo took him to one side and said, look, can't do that. Uh, You you know, just call it. And he calms Spectre down. But then, yeah, he suddenly produces these extra score, extra parts and asks them to to do it. And uh, Spectre getting very worked up and the musicians do it but they get paid. and They get paid, yeah. yeah. And Spectre probably thinking he's in an American studio where, you know, he just sort of runs his own studio and gets what he wants and just it, yeah. de- demands yeah, yeah. things. But he's yeah. he's on somebody else's clock, the Beatles and DMI's clock right now. And um, it's also the day, apparently, that John and Yoko announced to the press that they have undergone a sex change operation. Yeah, so, I mean, this, this isn't, this isn't hmm. uh, given enough attention. Uh, I think. Um, well, it is April the 1st, we should point out. It is April the 1st, and they do make this announcement. And I think this is just another one of John and Yoko's increasingly desperate attempts to... Uh... <laughs> yes, yes, they're, they're, they're not getting ahead of the curve of no. Genesis. Genesis Piorage had a similar project with his partner, Lady Jane, the Pandragene Project, where they both decided to merge together as a couple to become pansexual uh, beings, which are equal to each other. Lovely. How's that working out? Well, um, they're both uh, sadly passed away now, Lady Jane and Genesis Piorage. But, you know, mm. uh, it was a thing. Um, so April the 2nd is Spectre's last day. So, you know, um, seven sessions in nine days. He's back in EMI and he's putting together final mixes and putting together acetates to say, ta-da. Yeah, so everybody gets an acetate. Paul gets an acetate. And uh, Spectre does, I think, send a covering letter saying, any changes, let me know. That all seems reasonable. Well, you know, I think they need to take a break to listen to the record. So we shall take a break as well. And we'll be right back after this. End of part one. Intermission. End of intermission. Part two. Welcome back. So, yeah, uh, the Beatles are all sent copies of the Let It Be album. And, you know, we kind of know part of this story. Um, Three of the Beatles have been privy closely to what's been going on. One Beatle has been in absentia, potentially on purpose. Um, uh, But this is where some of the discourse breaks down as to whether Paul likes it and then doesn't like it uh, or changes his mind or what, where do we put all this? Yes, so we, we, Paul has put forward the position that, you know, Bill Spector ruined the song, put all these overdubs on it, doesn't like it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But he gets an acetate. Um, now, we think this must be around the 3rd or 4th of April. So it's finished on the 2nd. So let, let's say he gets the acetate on the 3rd or 4th. Both George and Ringo have said over the years, Paul okayed it. Uh, Ringo says, you know, I spoke to Paul on the phone and said, did you like it? And he said, yeah, it's okay. He didn't put it down. And then suddenly he didn't want it to go out. Two weeks after that, he wanted to cancel it. So that that is consistent with the sort of timeline. This is a... Uh, Ringo making statements in the context of the the court case in 1971. But I think consistently Ringo and George have said Paul was fine with this. He didn't he didn't make any take any great issue with this. Yeah, and and you know if we look at it in that context, Paul, you know, let's say he hears it at the start of April, he goes, yeah, it's all, it's fine. But then, you know, does he have a change of heart, or does he realise it's leverage, or does he just feel that? You know, and, and I'm not trying to get anybody in trouble, but we know at this time he's taking a lot of counsel from Linda and she, you know, very much is saying, you know, you, you're, you're your own man. You can do what you want. You can put together your own records. You know, she's being very supportive in, in that regard. And maybe that triggers him to think, 
well, wait, they can't Paul McCartney, damn it. They can't be, you know, making recordings behind my back. Yeah. And I think this is this is the story. This is the this is the narrative uh, yeah. that, that he puts forward. So in anthology in the book, he says, Alan Klein decided possibly having consulted the others. Well, he knows that's not true. He, 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 yeah, <laughs> he knows that's not true. And they said, but certainly not consulting me. Well, yeah, one maybe having consulted the others. He knows that Ringo and George are actively hands-on involved. He knows that John is involved. He knows that Spectre is there. And he knows that he was consulted about bringing Phil Spectre in. Yeah, the... The, well, the truest statement is, you know, uh, you know, we were getting a reproducer instead of just a producer, and he added all sorts of stuff, singing ladies on the long and winding road, backing that perhaps I wouldn't have put on. I mean, I don't think it made it the worst record ever, but the fact now that people were putting stuff on our records that certainly one of us didn't know about was wrong. I'm not sure whether the others knew about it. It was just, oh, get it finished up, go on, do whatever you want. We were all getting fed up. I think that's the truest summation of what was going on it needed to be finished it was good enough but in the grand scheme of the Beatles it's not really cool that a Paul McCartney song is coming out and he's never heard it before yeah although he's given the chance to make changes well Spectre, Spectre sends out the acetate with a note saying if anybody wants any changes let me know and I think I think the, tr- the truism there is we were all getting fed up with this this is a project that nobody really wanted to revisit nobody had any great love for the project um yeah you, you know the film we would have to wait until peter jackson uh to get the true love for the uh <laughs> for the project but this is in 1996 1997 when the anthology book comes out and he's he's paul is is saying i didn't know that phil Spector was involved i don't know what and he's he's pushing this suggestion that klein did this klein yeah. brought specter in he didn't consult anybody. He may have consulted the others, but he didn't consult me. And I think that's simply not the case. Well, here's an interesting interview you've pulled from the Evening Standard. So I'm going to um, uh, read Paul's statements. You can you can give commentary. Okay. Um, where Paul is saying, a few weeks ago, I was sent a remixed version of The Long and Winding Road with harps, horns and an orchestra and a women's choir at it. No one had asked me what I thought. I couldn't believe it. I would never have female voices on a Beatles record. Except for Linda, Yoko, yep, Patty yep, Boyd, yep. Uh, Maureen, uh, Marianne yep. Faithful, Lizzie True. Bravo, That's right. Gaylene Pease, and Mary Hopkin on Let It Be. Mm, okay. And then he says, I don't blame Phil Spector for doing it. Just make a note, he doesn't blame <laughs> Phil Spector. Um, but it goes to show that it's no good me sitting here thinking I'm in control because I'm not. Sitting sitting here? Sitting where? He's, he's not going to meetings and he's sending uh, Charles Corbin, his solicitor, with uh, a bass guitar to sit in at meetings. But anyway, anyway. Um, and he then says, anyways, I've sent a letter uh, to Klein asking for some of the things to be altered. Reader, they were not altered. They were not altered. And this is the letter that... Uh, He says, Dear Sir, in future no one will be allowed to add or subtract from a recording of one of my songs without my permission. I had considered orchestrating The Long and Winding Road, but I had decided against it. I therefore want it altered to these specifications. Strings, horns, voices and all added noises to be reduced in volume. Vocal and beetle instrumentation to be brought up in volume. Same thing, really. Um, Harp to be removed completely at the end of the song and original piano notes to be substituted. Four, don't ever do it again. Signed, Paul McCartney, CC, Phil Spector, John Eastman. Um, And yeah... No, no changes made. No changes made. No changes made. Now, <laughs> let's unpick all of this. Let's unpick all of this in the context okay. of the timeline. So, the interview that you that you refer to was published on the twenty first of April, but he actually yes. sat down uh, with Ray Connolly on the sixteenth of April. Okay. Yep. Two days after he sends the letter. Right. So he well, he says I have sent the letter. So he he thinks the letter's in progress and it's yes, going to yes. be fixed. That's fine. Six days after <laughs> the Paul quits the Beatles headline. Yes, that has happened in the run up to all of this. Yes, and one day before McCartney hits the shops. Yes. Right. S- yeah. So, so if people have listened to our McCartney episode. Paul puts out this press release and he's asked, does he see, you know, the Beatles getting together? And it more or less says no. And it triggers this wave of Paul quits the Beatles headlines. And it just happens to coincide four or five days before his debut solo album drops. Yeah. 
Exactly, exactly. Mm. So Ray Connolly, who has a, a, a really interesting book, a really great resource just called Ray Connolly's Archive, he speculates that this interview was Paul's way of communicating with the other Beatles. And he also has a little footnote in, uh, in the book um, after the interview where he records that John was absolutely incredulous that Paul was upset about the arrangement on Long and Winding Road. And he quotes John as saying, is that what this is all about? Paul ought to have thanked Spectre for all the work he's done on the record, making it possible for it to be released. None of the Beatles wanted anything more to do with it. So Connolly is saying John seems genuinely perplexed yeah. that this, this whole thing uh, that's happening now in, in sort of April, uh, May, is because of this arrangement. You know, that there's a genuine surprise and incredulity um, about and I, that. I think, I think it is genuine. I don't think John is duplicitous enough to sort of no. feign surprise. I think, you know, he, he, I think that's probably genuine to say, you know, from the other three point of view, oh, finally, we have something that's not the Glyn John's version. It, you know, it will do in, in, in Paul's kind of words, you know, oh, it's good enough, just kind of get it yeah. finished, do whatever you want. That's kind of where they're all at, you know, and I, I don't think the three of them are saying this is the way Beatle records should be done forever. But for this Beatle record, it just gets it over the line. It gets it over the line. And um, if, if we go back to, there's, there's a section of dialogue in, in Peter Jackson's Get Back, which yeah. takes place in the control room immediately after they have recorded this song. Yes. And um, they're, they're discussing it and George Martin is there. And George Martin says, uh, Paul's thinking of having strings anyway. And George Harrison says, Paul, are you going to have strings? And Paul says, you know, don't know, don't know. <laughs> um, and uh, George says, well, it would be nice for some brass just doing the sustaining chords, moving, holding notes. And it's George Martin who says, it's hardly Beatles mode. George Martin mm. is the one that's kind of thinking, you know, don't know. Paul is saying, the only way I've ever heard it, and we know that Paul hears the records in his head. And he says, yep. the only way I've ever heard it, like in my head, it's like Ray Charles's band. We're planning to do it anyway with a couple of numbers, just have a bit of brass and a bit of strings. That's what George was saying before. That's the bit where the Raylettes would sing it, the long and winding road. And George Martin says, like a chord. And then Paul and George start saying, that leads to your door. So he's, he's hearing in his um, head, <laughs> singing ladies. Singing ladies. There are some singing ladies on it. Like, it's all... Yeah. Uh, so yes. we know that George Harrison is at Phil Spector's shoulder for a lot of things. So maybe he's remembering this. Uh, but, but there is a discussion in Get Back where Paul is saying, yeah, strings, brass, singing ladies. The Raylettes, last time I looked, are singing ladies. Yeah, no, I, I, I remember seeing that bit in, in, in Get Back and going, oh, <laughs> you know, and yeah. it is the million yeah. dollar question particularly as we get into the afterlife of Let It Be and Let It Be Naked and all the rest, you know, there is no truth to this project, really. It was many different things. And, yeah. you know, once you kind of divert it off the track, I think, of rock and roll one after 909 type songs, you know, to kind of what you would call the non-rooftop songs, yeah. you are kind of getting into a bit of orchestration, a bit of management. And that's not dishonest. It's just whatever serves the song. It's just whatever serves the song. I think that's right. But I think the the point that I'm trying to make here is that in addition to knowing that Phil Spector was involved and having the opportunity at various points to go and stop him or get involved or have insight, plus the fact that he has an acetate, says, yeah, that's fine, it's okay, perhaps not with any great enthusiasm, which yeah. reflects his original plan for the arrangement, uh, that this particular incident becomes the focus for the next 50 years. I know, of, it really of, does. Of, and it just, it seems to me that it is a nothing incident. It should not be elevated to, to the position that it is. And it's just that it's focused on, to the extent that there are all these myths have grown up. So Tony, yeah. Tony Bramwell, <laughs> this he's, is very funny. He says, when Paul heard the Let It Be album mixed by Phil Spector, particularly what he referred to as Spector's sickly sweet version of The Long and Winding Road, he was furious. He rushed straight into Apple and berated Klein so loudly you could hear him throughout the building. It's not us anymore, he shouted. Klein's rude comment was, your original material sucked. It was unusable. John thinks Phil is a genius and I agree with him. 
That didn't happen. I'm sorry. Say that's about minus 10% true. It's just not true. But we do have George Martin in the anthology saying, um, I didn't like Phil Spector's Let It Be at all. I'd always been a great admirer of him. I always thought his recordings were fantastic. He actually created some great sounds. But what he did with Let It Be was to do all the things and not so well that we hadn't been allowed to do. And I kind of resented him for it. Because to me it was tawdry. It was bringing the Beatles records down a peg. That's what I thought. Making them sound like other people's records. There you go. I, well, I, 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 have, I have great respect for that because George Martin said right at the beginning when Paul was saying strings, Ray Charles, the Ray Letts, he was going, it's hardly Beatles mode. And he, yeah. he, he was identifying right from the beginning, uh, not just that this is not in keeping with the truth of the original concept of the Get Back Project, but this is not the Beatles mode. And we also know that Glyn Johns didn't like it. But again, he yeah. completely over eggs the pudding. He says, after the group broke up, John gave the tapes to Phil Spector, who puked all over them, turning the album into the most syrupy load of bullshit I have ever heard. Three songs, Glenn. He orchestrated three songs. Yes, and he managed to get decent mixes out of For You, Blue, and a few other songs that, yeah. sorry, Glenn, I don't think yeah. yours were, were, were there just yet. And Glenn Johns is a hugely talented man, but he didn't deliver for Get Back, no. I don't think. I don't think so. And 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 but the the point is everyone is saying let it be the album is this incredibly over the top production this overly orchestrated album. You know, he puked over the whole thing turning the album into a certain there are three songs and he didn't. He absolutely didn't. But but it's it's back to that argument you have as well about all things must pass that oh it's Phil Spector eyes. Yeah. Like, well there's not really. There's a bunch of songs that are totally not Phil Spectrized. There's one yeah. per side, maybe, and that's it. You know, can we all just calm down a little bit? Yeah, I think we should just calm down. And I think I, Phil Spector is not a one trick pony. You know, he can do the stripped down production on Plastic Owner Band if he, yep. he wants to. And um, I just think this one song and uh, this one thing has, has far too much uh, attention. It, it's blown out of proportion. Phil is completely <laughs> unrepentant. I mean, Phil is Can unrepent- I read this, please? <laughs> Phil, 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 Phil uh, is unrepentant about most things. Yes, this is true. But uh, uh, yes, I think, I think you should uh, uh, read this. Paul had no problem picking up the Academy Award for the Let It Be movie soundtrack, which happened in 71, nor did he have any problem in using my arrangement of the string and horn and choir parts when he performed it during 25 years of touring on his own. If Paul wants to get into a pissing contest about it, he's got me mixed up with someone who gives a shit. (laughs) That's kind of funny. That is kind of funny. No, I think that quote comes from the Q Awards. Um, yes. When when Paul McCartney was invited along to the Q Awards and then once there, supposedly he didn't know uh, Phil Spector was there as well, getting a Lifetime Achievement Award. And he stayed for everything and then got up and walked out um, when when Phil was getting his, his award. So. Yeah. And so this kind of brings us to April, May 1970. And so... As we've kind of broken down, you know, in October, we think it's Klein, Paul, George and Ringo talk about Spectre as a producer. He arrives in January. Instant Karma gets done. Paul knows that there are tapes afoot, we think. The letter comes out on the 31st of March. Um, Phil puts the strings on on the 1st of April. The acetates go out on the 2nd or 3rd of April, we think. And then a week later, it's the Paul quits the Beatles headlines. It happens remarkably quickly yeah and it's after that that he writes the letter and maybe he's thinking you know with a legal thing in mind to say well i wrote the letter and he didn't respond to my letter yeah you know there could be a game being played it it strikes me that the possibility there is that the eastmans are saying you need to put something in writing we need to get we need to get a paper trail lawyers very keen on paper trails because bear in mind he waits 10 or 11 days having received the acetate before, yeah. before he writes. And he must have known that when he writes the letter on the 14th, it's too late. Yes. And it's, it, 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 it is too late. You know, Paul's giving interviews that week. Uh, so the Ray Connolly interview is on the 16th. You know, he didn't pick up the phone. He didn't go into Abbey or to Savile Row to, to stake his claim. And, you know, it's, it's the week that, you know, the, the week that ends with McCartney, the album coming out to a suspecting world, as yeah. you like to say. Um, is the week that Derek Taylor puts out the the Beatles press release that they... Well, why don't you do your Derek Taylor? Spring is here and Leeds play Chelsea tomorrow and Ringo and John and George and Paul are alive and well and full of hope. 
The world is still spinning and so are we and so are you. When spinning stops, that'll be the time to worry, not before. Until then, the Beatles are alive and well and the beat goes on. The beat goes on. Ah, oh, good old, good old Derek. And Let, Let It Be comes out on the 8th of May. Uh, and maybe there's one little bit of revenge with the US single that comes out in May. Well, is it revenge? Klein, the last single released in the Beatles' lifetime, or is it in their lifetime, uh, is The Long and Winding Road, um, which gets to number one. Yeah, and it, it's the last track on the Beatles' one compilation many years later. It's officially one of their number ones. And one week later, on the 13th of May 1970, there's the world premiere of the film, in New York City and a week later in uh, Liverpool and in London. There's an awful lot of guests there. So there's uh, Richard Lester, Mary Hopkins, Spike Milligan, Lulu, Simon D, Sir Joe Lockwood, uh, some Rolling Stones, some Fleetwood Max, uh, 50 Harry Krishnas. I wonder how they got their tickets. Um, who's missing? No Beatles. Yeah. No Scylla. <laughs> no. No Donovan. No Donovan. None of them are there. Um, but Cynthia and Jane Asher were invited. That's a bit of a strange that, that um, yeah thing. they were they were invited they were on the invited guest list um which again that's an interesting an interesting thing but uh yeah i i so much happens and it happens so fast yes and i think for me the connolly interview on the 16th is key because i do think it bears the hallmarks of a lawyer having <laughs> because <laughs> If I were Paul's lawyer, if I were Paul's lawyer... Oh, if you were. <laughs> I would have said to him, we've got to write the letter to Klein yeah. and yeah. then go and give your interview to Connolly, which is on the 16th, and make it clear that you've written the letter and that you've asked for changes because that creates... That's a, an official record that you've asked for changes. And then when the changes aren't made, because we know it's too late... That's the, you're the victim. That's the, the, yeah, that's the trigger. That's the smoking gun, so to speak. And I think, I think Paul had decided the Beatles were over. Yes. You know, the instant karma, that, whatever, we are on Liberty Bell 28. Um, (laughs) But then the big 31st of March bus stop comes and the whole thing starts going. And I do think we, you for, we forget that although the Eastmans have officially been let go by Apple, they're still there. They're advising Paul. They're lawyers. They're doing what lawyers do and they're creating paper trails. They're setting things up. And I think there's a lot of that going on. And it's so much of this comes down to the personal animosity between the Eastmans and Klein. And no one is stopping to think who is the client the client isn't paul the client isn't john the client isn't george or ringo the client should be the beatles yes um that's that's the problem and no one will no one think of the beatles (laughs) well it's you know the the letter being a paper trail you know you see that at the bottom it says cc spills phil specter cc john eastman he knows what he's doing he knows what he's doing um we need to kind of think well what does it all mean? And, and certainly when when we were putting all this together, there is an afterlife beyond May 1970 that we will talk about some other time where Phil Spector gets involved in All Things Must Pass and Plastic Ona Band, and we've talked about those albums separately. And Alan Klein does not exit their lives in May 1970. There is a you know a further Alan Klein, the solo years that we'll have to do. It's yeah. another kind of 12 parts that uh, that we'll have to leave for another day. But my feeling has always been that you know, when you look at Let It Be, the album, when it drops with the movie in May 1970, it's kind of this notion of, well, this is this is pure Alan Klein. It is getting product out into the shops, irrespective of the costs, not really considering the artistic nature of these kind of processes. And, you know, we've been looking at the whole arc from Brian to Klein, Brian? You yeah. said Brian. <laughs> Brian. Brian. <laughs> but what what Brian's gift was, was, you know, indulging or respecting the Beatles as artist and also trying to bring in taste. You know, he was a man of great taste and flair and style. And you look at the last album that comes out in his lifetime, you know, it's Sgt. Pepper. You know, that's a fantastic culmination of all those things. You look at Let It Be and it's an album with 
you know, the cover isn't great, you can argue. It's, um, you know, it's kind of put together piecemeal, it's behind their back. But it it's kind of an Alan Klein project. It, it's representative of the man in charge. And I think when you look at that journey, I think those two kind of posts at the start and the end, Sergeant Pepper to, to let it be, one is filtered through Brian, one is filtered through Alan Klein. That's how I see it. I don't disagree with that. I think Sergeant Pepper is an art statement. It's an artistic endeavour. Mm. Uh, and I think the word you use for let it be, it's product. Yeah. It's product. It's, it's a tie-in product for a movie to generate cash under a new contract. And it does generate and cash. It, and it does generate cash. I mean, this is this is the, the this is the thing where I, I do, you know, I'm not saying that Alan Klein is a saint. I'm not saying that. that you, you love know, him. You think he's great. I think he's great. <laughs> he, he, he's he's my boyfriend. <laughs> but I but I I do think his reputation suffers simply because of the fact that the Beatles broke up. I think he's yeah. a contributing factor, but I think there are lots of other contributing factors. Um, you know, whether that's George starting to branch out on his own, Ringo starting to branch out on his own, the fact that John is now more focused on Yoko than the band, all of those things. But Klein is not the man who pulls the trigger. And Klein is brought in to do a job, and we may not like the fact that he was brought in to do the job, and we may not like the job that he was brought in to do, which is basically to get rid of the dead wood, sharpen everything up, and make the Beatles some money. That's the point. Artistically, Let It Be and uh, the film and the movie, I think would be much better regarded if they had come out in early 1969. They sound much more of a piece with the White Album yes, than they do and, with uh, Abbey Road. And it suffers because of the kind of wonderful production on Abbey Road and the wonderful sound. And then you have this back to basics thing. And everybody got back to basics in early uh, uh, in 1968 and 1969. <laughs> you know, yes. the band and Dylan and all. The back to basics stuff was so last year by the time Let It Be uh comes out no, no, no absolutely and you know that the thing that let it be has suffered from when we saw it when get back came out last year is that it comes out in may 1970 and april 1970 has been the month that the beatles to the public eye split up yeah and as soon as those two albums drop people are looking at them through a very negative lens and they're able to say, well, of course they've split up. You know, the, they're, they're picking up on all the things that are not right. You know, they're saying, well, there's Phil Spector. There's no George Martin. You know, uh, they, they're not together on the cover. It, 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 it is really hard to listen to Let It Be. And actually, it's a, it's a good album. It's 35 minutes. There's some great songs on it. I, I do like Let It Be. And I think, I know we give out about the box set a lot. I think Giles Martin's tinkering is really good. I think. I agree with you. I let, yeah. it be, let it be was one of the uh, first Beatles standalone LPs that I ever bought, and I have I have a great affection for it. I, I do think uh, Giles Martin's version of of the album is an improvement. Uh, I I still think it's hugely disappointing what, what went into the box around it, but I think the original album is is fantastic, and it is just tainted by surrounding circumstances. But we go back to this idea that when Brian passed away there was no one focused on there was no one that knew the band the way that brian knew the band and i think you know you maybe cannot fault the eastmans as lawyers you cannot fault klein's money making uh, uh facility but they didn't know the band they didn't know the personal interband intraband politics so they're yeah. advising paul to do something buy some shares. They, Brian Epstein would have known that... What that meant. Right, you need to go and say to John, let's all of us buy some shares. Let's all increase our shareholding. Brian yeah. would have known that. Brian would have known that that was, a, that, would, that was a red rag to John. Similarly, Klein didn't know that by focusing on John, uh, he was probably triggering something in Paul because Paul was very conscious that Brian Epstein favored john yeah you know yeah. so again there's 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 an insecurity of paul's there and klein is not aware of that klein seems to think that all he has to do is produce a shed load of money and <laughs> paul will think fantastic let's yeah. get in there um and always in the background there's this jockeying 
for position between Klein and the Eastman. So we can't get past the fact that it was John Eastman's letter to Clive about, we're going to look at the propriety of your late brother's negotiations. Yeah. That lost them names. Klein didn't have any time or opportunity to complete the names deal before that fell apart. By the yeah. time they get into Northern Songs, the, uh, the Eastmans have said to Paul, buy up some shares. Paul does that. Paul should have known, but the Eastmans did not know that that was going to be a trigger. And I do yeah. think that is Liberty Bell uh, day number one. Yeah, there, there obviously had to be somebody in 1969, you mm. know, and if if Brian hadn't died, you know, I, I don't think Brian could have maintained Apple himself anyway. I think somebody had to come in from a business. It was, it was too big and they were trying to set up too many things. Now, in my mind, you know, a fantasy 1968 Apple board would have been Brian and, you know, Neil Aspinall and Peter Asher as some kind of A&R. And that could have been a team that could have taken over the world, you know, yeah. bring George Martin in as a consultant, you know, from his private work or whatever. And there was a team of people there who could have guided them through 69 and into the, the 70s, you know. And I, I was also trying to think, well, who else was kind of in the ether? It was kind of the early days of um, David Geffen in the late 60s, you know, and uh, I know they were based in the US. But you look at something like David Geffen did with Elliot Roberts, that he is a man who was able to, you know, he's working with Crosby, Stills and Nash in 69. And he was able to kind of cultivate this artistic side, set up a record label, Asylum. You know, he delivered throughout the 1970s this kind of notion of artist-centred. Even the name Asylum, it's the artists have taken over the Asylum. That was the whole point of the label. So these ideas that they were trying to figure out were definitely ideas that were out there. There were people trying to deliver them as well. So somebody had to come into their orbit at that time to shake the tree, sort it out, tidy off, you know, get rid of the, you know, and, and just marshal it all together. And it just Alan was the guy there. Yeah, I think the difficulty is having had the concept of Apple, none of the four of them wanted to be the boss. No, no. You know, yeah, I know. So they, they are surrounded by good people like Mal and Neil and Ron Cass and, and Ken Mansfield and George Martin and all of these people are surrounding them. But at the end of the day, it becomes... A free for all. It's hemorrhaging yeah. money, so yeah. somebody has to be the bad guy, and nobody wants to be the bad guy. You know, they, they they're the artist. So you employ somebody. You employ an Alan Klein, a Peter Grant, you, yeah. you, you know, a uh, uh, Don Arden who goes in and takes care of Tom Parker, takes care of business. Um, yeah. But they are so inextricably linked to the personal brand of Apple, and they 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 have put that out there um, yeah. and so clearly identified themselves with that, that they can't, they can't be the guys that suddenly... It, it, it's, it's in the same way that they're suddenly embarrassed by the Maharishi um, yes. and they have to start rolling back from that and that's a public embarrassment. I think bringing Klein in is, is an acknowledgement that they cannot make Apple work. And it's... it's uh, you, you go back to Stephen Malt saying... Apple is a mess. Your personal finances are a mess. They're paying tax at a rate where I, I think the figure is they have to earn £120,000 for every £10,000 that they spend, yeah. which is is nuts. Yeah, it's like a 90% tax rate. Yeah, yeah. the personal relationships are fracturing. So somebody has to um, come on board and everybody is in agreement. We have to yeah. get, get rid of it. You know, that, that's the irony. The Eastmas and Klein have the same solution. They do, they do. And I mean, Derek Taylor, uh, you know, facilitates Klein coming into the inner sanctum. And, you know, Klein realises very quickly with the eye that we talked about back in Klein episode one, that, you know, their EMI contract is inadequate, that NEMS, their deal with NEMS is inadequate, getting their 25%, that they've poor merchandising, that Apple has all these kind of branches that need to be trimmed back. So it wasn't rocket science um, in, in any regard. And if you actually you know, you've got some figures here in terms of the money that they've earned. The figures are actually staggering what happens. They, they are absolutely staggering. So, you know, there's, there's, there's probably 10 or 12 or 25 episodes on the court case that we could, we, we could talk about. But, but basically the argument that, that the Eastmans and Paul were putting forward uh, in, in 1971 was Apple is broke. Uh, there's yes. tax liabilities. We don't have any, uh, uh, you know, ability to pay this. And Klein is not to be trusted. But the figures that come out, so for the year ended March 1969, the Beatles had earned 
£850,000, which is the equivalent of £15.7 million. But that yep. would be a lot of money to you or me, Jason. But um, <laughs> Yes, but there's tax on it owed on that, I guess. Yeah, for the nine months, so that was for the year to March 69. For the following nine months, they'd earned £1.7 million, which is 30, 31 million in today's money. For the year 1970, this had increased to four million, which is the equivalent of 80 million. So the, the total Beatles income, to put it all in perspective, between 1962 and December 1968, their total income was 7.8 million 60s pounds. Which yes, is, so that's for the six years from 62 to 68. And that's equivalent to 144 million earned in 2022 monies. So over a six year period, in the 19 months that Klein was was there, it was nine million in in 19 months, which is 166 million pounds in 19 months, as opposed to 144 million in six years. That's not a bad day's work. That is definitely worth repeating. That Alan Klein in 19 months got them the equivalent modern day equivalent of 166 million so he's generating about nine million quid a month for the Beatles in modern money which is in excess of what they had earned in the previous six years um so by that metric he's the man job done job done he is the man but you get but you get to this question of but at what cost there is no band at the end of it exactly this is this is this is the point this is the point he gets all this done, they're making money, he's turned it all around, but the cost is the personal relationships within the band have broken down. Now, Klein, I think, is a contributing factor. The Eastmans yep. are a contributing factor. The divorce with Cynthia, the split with Jane, Yoko's arrival, George going off to work with Delaney and Bonnie, Ringo going into films, uh, all of these things are contributing factors. But I think there was no one with the sort of emotional intelligence yep. to, to look yep. at the band. The, the one person I think in that sort of coterie of people that they have around them might have been Derek Taylor, mm. who knew, who he, he had a personal relationship with all of these people. And he was of sufficient stat. You know, Mal was the roadie. You know, he was indispensable and he was a key part, but he was the roadie. Neil Aspinall, who briefly kind of undertook a sort of caretaking role in, in late 67 for, for the business. He was out of his depth um, and didn't have the confidence. George Martin was in the musical side. Yeah, Derek Taylor, I think, had the personal connection with each of them. But we know that Derek, I mean, he famously says, I never hated anybody as much as I hated Paul McCartney in 1968. So he, he's <laughs> alienated as well from one side. So I think there's a lot of things happening here. Everyone is doing their job and doing it well, and there is no one overseeing the egos in the band. There's no one managing the personal relationships in a way that Brian Epstein managed to do. Now, maybe by 1967, his even Brian's grip on that was slipping, but but he was able yeah. to do that. But he certainly had the 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 ear and the respect of the four of them. Still, you know, if the, if he needed to marshal them, it seemed he could marshal them. But yeah, yeah, you get to the pros and cons of 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 uh, Alan Klein. You know, he cleaned up Apple. He sorted out the royalty rate. He loved John Lennon. He laid the basis for their solo careers, particularly John George's and Ringo. He made the money. He's responsible for the Red and Blue albums, which kind of set up the Beatles revivals. You can yeah. argue in yeah. the seventies and into the eighties. Um, but on the downside, he drove this wedge between Paul and the others. And there was the shenanigans with Bangladesh and all the rest. And he was dodgy. You know, he was yeah, dodgy. I'm, and I'm absolutely, absolutely. I mean, he, uh, he, he, was, a, he was a crook uh, at the end of the day. But, he, but doesn't he, that feed into why, like, if he was making so much money, why did the court report, appoint a receiver in the end? Yeah, you see, again, the, the sort of the narrative is, or the sort of accepted truth is, oh, Klein was a crook and he was ripping them all off and he was taking all this money and the court had to intervene. But the main argument that was being put forward by the, the, by, by the Eastman camp was... Um, yeah, the Apple is financially in trouble and Klein is not to be trusted and all the money is going to disappear. But that clearly was not the case. But the judge went back to Liberty Bell Day number two, um, where a board meeting was held. If you remember, they got Neil Aspinall, George and John 
signed the management contract. Yeah. So the judge basically was taking the view, yes, all day-to-day -day business in the partnership can be conducted by a majority, and that is absolutely fine. However, this type of thing, where basically this is such a fundamental shift in, in the business operation, this is not a day-to-day -day matter. So this is not something that can be imposed by the majority partners on a minority partner. This is something that requires unanimity. It is such a fundamental decision. If it had just been, we're going to buy new cars, we're going to move office, we're going to, that, that was fine. But this is such a fundamental point that he said that was a breach and removed the trust. The other thing was he did say ABCO has made grossly excessive claims for commission and received commission in excess of that specified in the appointment. But went on then to say, there is no evidence that Mr. Klein has, without the knowledge of the defendants, that's John, George and Ringo, put into his pocket any money belonging to the firm or that he would do so. Now, that is very important because the inference there is that John, George and Ringo agreed to let Klein increase his commission. Mm -hmm. and paid yeah. him extra money and felt no need to run that past Paul. But the judge is very clear that any money that Klein got was okayed and signed off on by John, George and Ringo. He did, however, say this whole situation yeah. is, is ridiculously uh, confusing. What I'm going to do is put a receiver in who will run the business and uh, that led to the breakup of Wings. But but I guess the point we're making is it wasn't a done deal that a receiver was going to rock up. It was a it was just the notion of the case because the judge had to decide that yeah as, as you've kind of said it there that this issue was too important for them to be voting on a majority when it yeah. came to money in Paul's pocket. Yes, and uh, the receiver is kind of put in there to tidy things up, not necessarily because it's insolvent, which is what you immediately think of when you think of a receiver. It's really exactly. the receiver is there to just get to the nuts and bolts and find out what it is. And John Eastman, when the receiver is appointed, says round one to the good guys. Uh, but Alan Klein says, yeah, the Eastman's won the round, but the victory was mainly in PR. If you were Eastman, how would you explain to McCartney that it's not Apple that's in receivership, but the Beatles and co? And that's a curious thing, that it's not Apple itself will continue to function and will continue to release records and they will continue to be tethered to it. Um, what it's actually done is it's cleaved Paul away from the other three. This is this is exactly it. This is exactly it. So, you know, Paul will be very successful. and, and uh, But we talked about in the Ram episode, Paul labouring over this idea that, you know, standing on a hilltop in Scotland deciding... I'm going to have to issue a writ against, uh, you know... My best mates. My best mates. Um, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, so what? And let's, and, and let's and, serve it on the last day of the year. And, uh, yeah, uh, and, and uh, as if to, uh, you know, as if to kind of rub salt into the wound, he still maintains he is right to this day and that the reason that the Beatles exist in the form that they do in the 21st century is because of the decisions he made in relation to that, which maybe in a future episode we can pull the thread and say that's not 100% true. I think it isn't 100% true. Um, no. You know, Paul talks about all the millions would have gone away to Alan Klein. All of the millions would have disappeared to Alan Klein. Uh, everything was going to be lost. And, and, and I think, you know, but they've all, they've all kind of commented on this. And it was obviously a difficult issue in, in anthology. Um, but uh, can we read some quotes from anthology? Well, let, let, let's, let, let's just give some final words over because, you know, I think it'll be up to the listeners to decide where they land on all of these things, you know, and, you know, if, if the Beatles had gotten their act together and reappeared at the end of 1970 with a brand new record, we'd probably be thinking very differently about how all this played out. But we're all too familiar with how it played out uh, in the end. So, yeah, well, let, let, let's, let's, let, let's go through some final quotes here. So John says, uh, we were impressed by the way he handled the business deals for the Rolling Stones. Besides, he has some of the cleanest polo neck sweaters I've ever seen. He's the only businessman I've met who isn't grey right through the eyes to the soul. Hmm. Uh, well, George says, uh, because we were from Liverpool, we favoured people who were street people. Lee Eastman was more like a class conscious sort of person. As John was going with Klein, it was much easier if we went with him 
two. So there's George essentially blaming uh, John and Paul. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ringo, my impression of him when I first met him was a brash, I'll get it done, lads. Loads of enthusiasm, a good guy with a pleasant attitude about himself in a really gross New York way. <laughs> really gross. <laughs> gross from New, but from New York, so that makes it all all right. And I like the earlier bit where John is basing his decisions on knitwear. That is very important. Well, we've all done it, you know. Um, what about uh, what about Paul? What about Paul? There's a whole book here uh, uh, of, <laughs> of Paul. Um, yeah, he said the whole story in a nutshell. That's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to do. And this is from 2021. This is Paul's. Yes, reminiscence. this is the most up to date. The whole story in a nutshell is we were having a meeting in 1969 and John showed up and said he'd met this guy, Alan Klein, who promised Yoko an exhibition in Syracuse. And then... The matter of fact, John told us he was leaving the band. It is basically how it happened. It was three to one because the other two went with John, so it was looking like Alan Klein was going to own our entire Beatle empire. I was not too keen on that idea. So much well, there. I think we've pulled all that apart in the last 400 episodes on Alan yeah. Klein. Like, he's really conflating an entire year yeah. into a paragraph there. Yeah. So he said, uh, so I stood up as the sensible one and said, this is not good. Klein wanted 20%. And I said, tell him you can have 10% if you have to go with him. Oh, no, no, no. They came back. No, he wants 20. It seemed to me they were all just fucking out of it and making no attempt to do anything sensible. A lot of hurt went down during that period in the early 70s. Them feeling hurt, me feeling hurt. But John being John, he was the one that would write a hurtful song. That was his bag. He doesn't forget, does he? He doesn't forget. He saved, he them. He saved them all, you know. Oh, he did. It let, let, this is a lovely quote from Derek Taylor, which I find, you know, good old Derek. Uh, Klein was supposed to be intimidating, but he didn't intimidate me because I felt he was like a lot of those heavy people. I felt he was vulnerable. I felt Frank Sinatra was very vulnerable when I met him too. I could see there was a side of Frank that really wanted to be liked. I felt there was a part of Klein that I could reach. Hard men are like that sometimes. But if you were easily frightened, if you scared easily, he was frightening. He had little eyes that were all over the place. Alan was from New Jersey, from another culture from us. We at Apple, who had been with the Beatles for a number of years, thought we could pretty well do anything. Hey, so he's got a hard reputation. We need his efficiency. And if there's anything awkward about him, then we can contain that. Wise words. Completely wrong, but wise words. <laughs> yes, it didn't really, uh, didn't really work out that way. Um, do we give Derek the final word then? I think, yeah, I think we should. There's a great article called The Party's Over for the Beatles. Now, this is, this, this is from the 26th of July, um, 1970, and it was published in the Sunday Times magazine. And uh, he said, The Beatles used to say many times long ago when age 30 was too far away from them to need to be accurate. They used to say, we can't be 30-year-old Beatles. No more can they. And Ringo was 30 in July, and John in October, and even baby George in his 28th year with a beard like Abe Lincoln hmm. and the eyes of someone who is getting very deeply into the mysteries of life. To say they have done it all is to beg the question, what is life if you've done it all? But have they not done everything as a group that such a group can do without climbing aboard their own mitt and riding it like a loop tape into vaudevillian oblivion? In any case, it will be a long time before they are not contemporary. It is archive time at Apple and I am starting to chronicle what happened in the 60s when the mop tops burst out of Liverpool. There are many words and pictures and a whole lot of music to shape their story and maybe the end will never be written. For who could really say the end to the Beatles? Not me, man. Not me. Says it all, really. Says you it know? all, really. Summer of 1970, they were, they were putting it all down. Yeah. The archive had begun. But what do you think, everybody? <laughs> I, I, I think what we've tried to do, Stephen, in, in, in this season is to try and um, fill in the blanks that if you had come to the Get Back uh, eight-hour marathon last year to try and understand the context of where they were in the middle of all this, what had happened before and what had happened afterwards. And I hope we've managed to tease out some of that across this season. Yeah, I think it is important to see everything in context and to see that timeline and not to underestimate the the impact of Brian's death, the impact of all of these things that are happening in their personal lives along the way. And uh, But ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, it's the Beatles. It is. It is the Beatles, you know, and it's for all of these events across the end of the 60s, you, you really have to kind of put yourself in the point and realise that on any given day, the future was 
unwritten that we're so used to particularly on podcasts like this to kind of tearing apart the past because it's so clear but again going back to Peter Jackson's you know in January 1969 none of that was written Uh, we didn't know what was going to happen and uh, you know these are the events so you can make your own conclusions I guess yeah I think so I I think that is important it's it's each day is a potential pivot point uh, Mm. across all of these all of these issues But what do you think, everybody? We always want to talk about these things in the usual places. The Nothing Is Real Facebook group, um, where there are many conversations all the time about all things Beatles. We're on Twitter at BeatlesPod. We're happy to get involved there. The website, nothingisrealpod.com. There is our ACAST Plus episodes. So this whole season of From Brian Epstein to Alan Klein uh, coverage, there's some parallel episodes on ACAST Plus where we look at the you know, um, John and Cynthia Lennon. We look at the All You Need Is Love sessions. We look at the Hey Jude album. And we're also looking at the Zappel label. All these things that were also happening in this orbit uh, between Brian Epstein and Alan Klein. So thanks for, for those of you who subscribe already. And if you start to get withdrawal symptoms, you can go off and enjoy those episodes to go even deeper into what happened all around this time in the late 60s. And uh, But nothingisrealpod.com is the website where you'll get the portal to all of those things. And we want to thank you all for listening and for all your support in season six. But for now, my name is Jason Carty. My name is Stephen Cockcroft. And this has been Nothing Is Real. Thanks for listening. Whew. Yeah, well, I guess it, it, is, it is the end of the season episode, isn't it? Yeah. And that's where we end our story. Perhaps in some small way, this series has helped a few fans, both old and new, to understand how it happened and what it was all about. But we'll leave the last word of all to Paul, who was asked for his reaction to this production. I thought it was incredible, actually, yeah. It was amazing. Because, I mean, half of the things you hear about on there, when it's all put together in a big story, you know, you just, I didn't, I didn't know half of the facts on it, you know. Just, I mean, you hear about what the publisher thought and what he thought and what the inside story of what he said, and it's quite interesting, I think, you know. Uh, you know, I'm glad it's all kind of capsuled like that, you know, and all put down, because it helps me, really, you know, it's, it's as if that was it, you know, and it's finished now, folks. It's been done, it's been covered. Thank you.